Hello, everybody. Uh, trying something a little new here today. Um, I got a chance to talk with somebody um, that's a um, big inspiration to me musically. Uh, and I'd like to keep talking to more musicians, uh, especially vocalists, about their vocal health, how they got into music, all those types of things. Um, the way I grew up and perpetuated most of my life, I didn't really talk to uh, a lot of creative people. I kind of stayed in a bubble, my introverted, uh, highly sensitive bubble. And uh, and uh, it's, it's quite a shame, man, because um, uh, now that I'm almost 40, I uh, am starting to be appreciated and respected more for what I do and uh, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I wish I could have experienced that earlier in life, but things happen the way that they do. Anyway, got to talk to this dude, uh, Nick Barker. He's from a band called 12 Foot Ninja or an ex-member of that band, I should say. Um, if you've never heard of them, dude, what crazy artistic talented um, music there's humor in it there's great lyrics he's a great front man a great singer and um from the talk i got to have with him just uh seems like a genuinely sweet wonderful person very intelligent very uh well spoken and um like i said it was kind of an honor to be able to um ask and, and have somebody like that be like yeah man i'll talk to you so um without further ado we'll get into that um, like I said, if you think some you have somebody that uh, might want to talk to me about vocal stuff, um, I don't really care what walks of life or music they come from, but um, very interested in their mental health story, how they got to where they're going, how they grew up, what drove them to music, what drove them to create, all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, so I hope you enjoy this. Uh, like I said, this is Nick Barker. Again, if you haven't watched 12 Foot Ninja, I'll put a little excerpt in here uh, <laughs> of uh, some of their tunes. And then we'll kick off the title sequence and we'll do this. Thanks, everybody. We are always with you. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm speaking today with a tremendous vocalist, a performer, musician. His name is Nick Barker, also known as Kin. Um, he's known for his work mostly with 12 Foot Ninja. I hope he's okay with me saying that. And uh, he's lent his vocals to a lot of other things. Also done some voiceover work, which I heard, which was also exceptional. Not many people jumping into that game and doing it well, but you did that well uh, also. So thank you. Very sir. nice. Very nice for you to join me here. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start out by I'm infinitely interested in people's upbringing and stuff like that. I hope that's not a terrible place to start. Like this fucker wants to know about my my mom and dad. But I'm um, <laughs> definitely interested to, you know, to know about what it was like growing up in Australia, what it was like for you growing up, you know. So where were you born? So I was born in Melbourne, Australia, um, which is in a state called Victoria, which is uh, southern Australia on the uh, eastern seaboard. And um, yeah, December 23rd, 1976, I was Excellent. born at the uh, Queen Victoria Hospital. Oh, that sounds, sounds fantastic. So, um, you know, us Americans are pretty ignorant when it comes to most of these things. So I don't know that much about what it would be like growing up in Australia from, except for the things I've seen in television and movies, which I'm sure does not set me up with the greatest background. So, uh, so what was it like? Did you grow up in Melbourne or were you, you know, on the outskirts? Were you in a, you know, tell me about that. I did. Um, I lived in a, a suburb just northeast of the city called Ivanhoe. Um, well, actually, Ivanhoe East, they call it. And um, yeah, I had, I had an interesting upbringing. Um, it, was a, it was a mixed bag. Um, it was basically, you know, my parents divorced when I was young. I was like two. Oh. Um, and, you know, so single child with single mum. And um, my grandpa was quite a wealthy businessman. 
uh, he was a restaurateur and also did his toast into some other things. And he decided to subsidize my schooling. So I went to a local uh, private school, mm. uh, which was an all boys Anglican school. I was waiting and for it. It was insane. Um, <laughs> that, that, you know, that shaded a lot of my, my uh, childhood. Um, and, you know, and then the, you know, I was, uh, I guess being a, a single child divorced parents, that was, that was a bit of a conflict. So I kind of, I grew up in a really nice leafy, fairly affluent suburb. Um, but yeah, basically, um, living in the crucible of, of, you know, right. Trauma and all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting childhood. It was a real mixed bag. Um, you know, I look, I look back fondly on a lot of stuff yeah. and not so fondly on a whole heap of other stuff as well. So it was, yeah, it was an interesting childhood, a colorful one. So how long does the all boys thing last in that kind of, you know, school experience? Like, is that till you're 16? Is that to your, you know, is it, when does that end? If I had have followed the course um, from five, which is preparatory, um, and then you've got, you know, grade one, two, three, four, five, six, which is the end of primary school right. um, or elementary school. And then you have um, what they called middle school, which was year seven and eight, Same. which were, were there to prepare you for high school, uh, essentially, which was nine, 10, 11, 12. So you'd leave usually around 18, um, 17, 18, depending on, you know, how old you were when you began school. Uh, I can't even imagine that just testosterone filled upbringing. <laughs> I mean, then again, though, yeah, then again, having just kind of being, I guess, confiding in a mother and, uh, and kind of just having that female perspective when you go home, that's got to be a weird dichotomy to deal with. And uh, now was your grandfather like a parental figure to you or just kind of there to be like, you take money? Yeah, he tr he tried to be, but it was yeah, definitely not in an, in the emotional sense. Um, I think uh, he wanted me to be the son that he didn't have, right. and uh, so he'd he'd basically placed me at that school so that I'd become a a, a businessman essentially and a and a you know a high achiever sporting wise. I oh, wasn't okay. that way at all. Um, my dad. Uh, is a musician and, a, and an artist in his own right. And um, yeah, I kind of, I definitely took on a lot of my dad's DNA. And so I was, I was always creative. And I guess um, in order to deal with, you know, some of the more traumatic experiences I had as a child, I retreated into that world, into that creative imaginary world um, as an escape. And so school was kind of quite confronting for me because they were, they were really pushing you to be um, academically inclined or at least on the level of, you know, having a good enough memory to remember, you know, um, yeah. facts that you'd learn throughout the year in order to pass a test. It was all very much rote based learning. It wasn't experiential um, and yeah, very much male dominated. And if you were, if you were slightly creative, um, you were seen as uh, effeminate, and wow, that's and, really interesting. Yeah, and and I was kind of effeminate, I guess, because I had I, I was in the pocket of my mum, you know, for so long. Um, she was very open and honest with me about about her womanhood and what it's like to be a woman and the trials of women and and all of those things. So she wasn't a staunch feminist by any right, but. I learned a lot about the female experience through her. She was very open with me. So I'd then go into this male dominated sort of uh, uh, environment and it was incredibly conflicting and confronting. And the art side of me was, um, it was fortunately for me, encouraged by female teachers at the school. Wow. Um, a lot of the female teachers there were, were in the arts. So, um, I had a wonderful uh, dramatic arts teacher who really pushed me into that sort of area. Um, I also had a, a you know a wonderful music teacher, and she was she was so encouraging. Um, so I was fortunate that I actually had 
some female influence at the school that were kind of going, no, don't, don't worry about them. If yeah. you're creative, go for it, do it um, with full support. So it was a very jarring experience, essentially. Yeah, I'm sure that that conflict would uh, play out in many other areas of your life until you kind of got a handle on it and realized where it came from. It's funny yeah. sometimes not to just jump in this and, and be ignorant and be like, we're the same person, because that's goofy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so many fans will do that, too. They're like, you wrote that song, and I felt it, and it was me, and we're the same. <laughs> we like the same We like the same bands. Um, no, but not to get weird like that, but sometimes you're you're drawn to communicate with people and stuff, and then everything you just talked about rings uh, very true to me and the effeminate thing and the, the female side of things and being safer, drawn towards that and everything. It's just really interesting to hear. Um, and not, uh, not enough males talk about shit like that because we're still kind of afraid a lot of times to communicate about that. It does bring up an interesting factor that I've heard. I'm a straight man, but uh, I've heard in Australia that's a little bit more of an open, relaxed thing, like being gay and things like that, but then kind of, you know, you never know when that, that kind of eased up because when you were growing up, I'm sure it could have been different, but I thought that was an interesting thing to bring up. Australia is still quite conservative. Um, it's, uh, it is a little bit backwater um, as far as, like, we're progressive. I think, I think a lot of the mainstream here are quite progressive, um, but uh, there are still perceptions of, perceptional values of reality that are still beholden to the fifties and the sixties. Yeah. And, but what was interesting was, I think, um, you know, arts had a major contribution to our society, especially in the eighties. Um, artists like Ken Doan and there were, there were quite a few like really mainstream artists, mm -hmm. um, that were lauded by the public. And I think, art, music, culture, um, you know, it, it really made a lot of headway throughout the 80s. So even though we were kind of coming out of the depressing 70s um, into the coke fueled, you know, <laughs> um, executive 80s, um, there was a lot of culture. And what was interesting, I mean, I, I grew up, my dad um, was a performer, musician, so he was gigging a lot. And a lot of his friends were gay. And, you know, I had surrogate uncles that were gay. My mum had a best friend who was gay. Mm. Um, there were kids that I went to school with who I knew were gay at yeah. a very young age. Um, yeah. Only because I'd sort of, I'd grown up around the nuances of it. And, and I knew what it meant. I knew what it was about. Um, I wasn't at all uh, prejudicial about any of that. It was, uh, it was quite normal. Yeah. And... I think a lot of modern society, especially in those days and with the advent of AIDS, um, sort of the gay struggle kind of came to the fore. And I think it was during that time that a divide was created. So with, you know, more progressive thinking people, gays were embraced mm. and championed. And, you know, you'd have straight people attending the gay Mardi Gras in Sydney every year and, and just, just to celebrate love and yeah. culture and color and and expression and then you had the old guard you know that that you know pre-80s kind of boomer brigade that had a very very difficult time uh you know embracing that simply because they were they were brought up as as conservative christians um and you know, then Leviticus comes into things and all of that. And, and so there was, there was kind of, uh, definitely a misogynist based, right. Right. uh, prejudice against, against homosexuality, because, you know, really a lot of that stuff's all, all, um, uh, it's all fear-based. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Change, you know? Um, so I think there's, there's still aspects of that in our culture. There is still, um, yeah, there are still uh, xenophobes and there's still misogynists and there's still racists. And, but I think um, there's probably more. There is a silent majority, as they call them, but there's also more progression um, as far as our thinking is concerned and our perception of, of 
social value and sexual values and all of those things. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's always dividing lines. So, I mean, you know, recently with, with, you know, LGBTQ plus sort of coming to the fore, there's been quite a, quite a, you know, a snap back at that because it's more change. Yep. Um, and I think people calcify in their, in their perceptional values um, to the point where when things evolve or move or are reshaped or reworded or new terms are introduced, people kind of have this real cognitive dissonance against it. So yep. um, we still, we're still just like you guys um, trying to, trying to uh, work our way through a lot of that old rooted, you know, um, perceptional value. Yeah, you, you hope to see that it kind of uh, see people grow and evolve. But a lot of times, sadly, I think it's more about just the dying off and the ushering of the of the new. My father, for example, is about 64, 65, has terrible trouble with the gay stuff. And uh, I did not grow up in a religious household, but I don't know where that shit comes from. Um, it's still a problem. But, you know, when I every time I'm faced with seeing different people doing different things living their lives in different ways it empowers me because then i'm like oh yeah you can just fucking do whatever you want to do man i can put on a silly hat fucking it doesn't matter like it really doesn't matter it's empowering to see that and but i end up um usually getting along with and meeting a lot of people that are gay and you know trans and things like that and i always end up gelling with them and i have my whole life and i was always kind of curious as to why but i think that those people tend to be I don't know, man, a little bit more beaten down and sensitive to life and sensitive to ridicule and all those things. And that tends to be the world I live in as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot could be said for, for trauma, you know, um, yep. what trauma tends to do, and especially in formative years, um, you know, or through the teens, yep. what it tends to translate to, there is the other side of this coin, but um, for a lot of people, what it translates to is empathy and compassion and understanding yep. um yep. because you've you've suffered loss or or trauma you can't bear to see other people suffering that either no matter where they fit on the political or social spectrum um you kind of you you end up cultivating an awareness of these things and when you see someone suffering you're like no that's that's not on um so it doesn't matter about their proclivities or anything um that's beside the point. It's that they're human beings. And I think a lot of, a lot of the people that I grew up with that had also experienced sort of trauma and hard times was yeah. the loveliest people and, and incredibly understanding and embracing of people that were marginalized by society um, or downtrodden. Um, so, yeah, I think that comes out, that also comes out of, you know, uh, if you yourself have have experienced marginalization or victimization or anything like that, yeah, very easy to to feel compassionate for someone else who who is. Yeah, man, and that would definitely be ex the ex explanation for it. Now, this is even more personal, and obviously, we don't have to go too far down this rabbit hole as we already have. But um, have you have you lived and uh, gotten down deep inside enough to kind of figure out what the nature of the biggest you know, thing you carried around from your trauma was. I know for me personally, uh, finding out not many years ago that one of mine was abandonment issues and finding out that that still is playing out in my life in different ways and having those aha moments and be like, ah, oh, I fucking, I fucking see what's going on here. But, uh, but yeah, have you been able to kind of tie it to, to like something and, and kind of hopefully reverse it? I mean, it's hard to fix things when you're not aware of them, of course, but uh, yeah, it does is. that make sense? Um, absolutely. Um, fear of abandonment was a big one for me, uh, because I experienced the separation of my parents, um, not when they separated, but I grew up into the awareness that dad wasn't living with us. Yeah. I was traveling to his place, you know, once a fortnight, once every two weeks and hanging out with him for a weekend, living in this completely different world, this art fused world, mm. um, of expression and everything and then going back to a, what felt like a somewhat domesticated pedestrian right you know suburb a suburban life yeah. um so you know and there were times he was he, he was an active musician gigging a lot um there were times when he wouldn't show up to pick me up 
you know, and I'd be sitting there at the window. It's that old scene, you know, where I'm sitting at the window waiting and, you know, mum's coming over going, oh, I don't think he's coming. And uh, that's... she tried to call him and he, and he wouldn't answer. And it would have been that he'd had, you know, a massive gig the night before, slept through an alarm, right. you know, and he, he is a bit of a hedonist as well. So like he was, he was living his life. And um, right. at the time, of course, that, you know, I, loved my dad always always have always will but it was that real kind of um what it kind of came down to was i'm i'm not worth that um that uh <laughs> you know i'm not i'm not worth his love i'm not worth the phone call or yep. you know um so i think there is a fear of abandonment but i think what it what it kind of became attached to was certain other um, perceptions of myself, like self-doubt. Um, yeah. Uh, imposter syndrome um, that kind of, I, I got to kind of experience in great depth and detail when I, when I joined 12 foot ninja um, and had to confront a lot of that stuff. So I think it's kind of, to me, it's more like a, Fear of abandonment is probably at the center, but if I was to pin it like a mind map, there'd be a few other branches yep. to that tree. Um, but I've done a lot of exploration um, with that and uh, a lot of reconciliation, um, you know, with who I was as a child and which included actually reconciling my child, you know, um, yep. talking to myself at that age. Yep. Um, in an inner sense, um, but as a as a parental figure or a, or a, you know a caring um, support for that yep. child, I did a lot of work on that. Um, so yeah, I've I've done therapy, I've done all sorts of things, um, but I think you know this is why I chose music. It just it gave me a, a means of pouring myself out tapping into these things in on a subconscious level and making sense of myself and somewhat reconciling with it. And it's always a work in progress, as you stated, you know, um, but yeah, I, I, I think I was kind of drawn to that kind of expression because I could, I could finally place it somewhere outside of myself and then see it for what it really was. And, um, yeah. 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 I mean, we, most of us, uh, singers and stuff and lyricists usually find that if we're, writing about somebody else, if we really break it down, we're writing to ourselves. If we're writing an angry song, we're pretty much writing, everything ends up to me always feeling like a blanket. And it feels like I'm just writing, you know, and putting a blanket around myself and having somebody be like, it's okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, even with, uh, you know, the tool and Maynard and shit like that, I, I tend to just, I can hear all the songs and hear the people talking to themselves. And, you know, like I said, it, it always just circles back around and wraps around. So, um, man, I appreciate you sharing that. That's wonderful. And, um, and you put it so eloquently and just uh, more people need to hear about this stuff. Um, I never sought out to necessarily be like, I want to talk about mental health and everything, but the, the older I get, the more I'm like, I kind of do want to hear about yeah. people's stories and people's triumphs and people that fucking just went through the hardest stuff and came out the other end. And, you know, everybody's at a different part of their journey too. Like I said, I, I, still am recently kind of finding out some of these things and, and picking up the pieces and be like, Oh, that's why that happened. And that's how I did that. And that's how I brought that into my life, et cetera. But anyway, when, when you got into music, it's great that you had a father that was playing and stuff. I didn't, I didn't have any of the musical background stuff, but I did have an epiphany that affected me so heavily that I was like, Oh, that's what I want to do. But did you have something like that? Or was it just that, you know, dad was kind of this, exciting thing and that kind of drew you towards music can you tell me about that like what, what think was the it, entry point you know yeah it kind of it manifested itself pretty early so um music was around me you know since the time i was born even before that um they were playing music to me in the womb but hmm. um i kind of made a very early connection to it um as an art form and and luckily fortunately in those days um, popular music was actually mainstream. So we, we still had TV shows playing music videos and, oh, yeah. um, we had this great show, uh, in Australia called countdown 
and you know it was on once a week and they did the the countdown of the national top 20 charts i think it was for memory but they'd also have acts playing live yeah. and um so i was exposed to it all the time and um yeah i guess i just through that through you know being with dad and being around his music um my mom was kind of like a closet singer so she'd sing at home she didn't consider that she had a good voice but she really did Same. um but she'd she'd sing all the time um you know i there was always music playing yeah. and uh so yeah i think where it really connected for me was the spectacle of kiss okay. um i saw kiss for the first time on countdown and just right. went oh my god I'll, <laughs> i want to be that yeah <laughs> it was gene simmons actually um you know sp spitting fire and blood and and up there with his big boots and and just i, I something about it I just went, yes this is this is it and um uh that really opened a door and then from there like my parents would instead of um i still got toys for birthdays and christmas and stuff but they'd buy me records oh and, yeah, um, amazing and uh my mum bought me a, a kiss guitar uh for yeah. one of my birthdays in this kiss makeup set and <laughs> so on the weekends you know i'd just say to her can i be gene yeah you know? and and she'd paint me up as gene simmons and then um she'd sit by the record player playing DJ and I just sort of call out song titles to her and she'd put them on. So, and that's I'd amazing. Be playing on the couch, you know, and, and singing everything. And, um, uh, yeah, it was soon after that, that dad got me a, he bought me a drum kit cause he, he could see that I was starting to grow this interest. Um, so he bought me a drum kit. So I'd sit there drumming along to things. Um, but there was always something musical, going on so i think that's where the connection was made yeah as far as um deciding that this is what i wanted to dedicate my life to that occurred much later so um you know i'd, I'd gone through some pretty harrowing experiences at that private school right um being a musician and it was kind of um <laughs> they really tried to dissuade me from taking that path but the more I stuck to it, the more reward there was. And so I was, um, I was studying instruments and getting quite good at them. And, uh, you know, I started in a choir on my second day of school because I realized that you could cut class. <laughs> that, right. I didn't want to be there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd met this guy on the first day of school and I think both of us were crying at the entrance of the school and my mum kind of went, Hey, let's talk to them. And, so we just, we became friends on that first day. And the second day he didn't show up to class. And then, um, he arrives sort of, you know, early afternoon and sits next to me. And I, I remember saying to him, where were you? And he said, oh, I was at choir. And I said, what? It's choir. And he said, oh, it's just people singing. And I went, that sounds good. Who do I need to <laughs> see to, to do that? It was because I wanted to get out of class. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was kind of, you know, fortunately there were, there were some, you know, key moments that kept spurring me on to the next thing. I became choir captain in um, grade six and then oh. year seven. Uh, but I'd gone through a bit of a traumatic experience in year eight um, at the end of middle school where um, I'd auditioned for um, the, the official production of Les Miserables um, and I'd auditioned as a part uh, for the part of Gavroche, who was basically, he became sort of the poster child of the French revolution. Um, and he's basically shot, he's killed and, you know, it, it rallies up the rebellion to, to fight against, against the government. And, um, so I, my then music teacher who had put me up for the audition, mm -hmm. he wanted me to sing my audition song as part of this medley of songs that we did at this end of year, um, you know, performance for most of the school. And I did the performance and he had orchestrated that at the end of it, a gunshot would go off and the lights would go down and that would be the end of the performance. And 
So anyway, I get to the end of the performance and the gunshot goes off, the lights go down and this kid in my class, I know exactly who it was too, um, shouted out and forgive him totally, but he shouted out, fuck it. Right. And the lights came back on and the whole school erupted in laughter. Right. And I just, I went, oh my God, I'm in danger. Yeah. And um, fuck. So I just in a, in a very psychological way started talking myself out of it and, um, uh, went and, and quit as choir captain. Um, and the, my music teacher slash, um, choir master wouldn't let me go. And he said that that's fine. We'll give your captaincy to someone else, yeah. but you have to stay in the choir. Um, so I did reluctantly. But what I did from that point was I literally forced my voice to break. So I started talking deeper. Hey, mom, how are you? You know, and like, like really like pushing into my chords and yeah. um, I caused damage mm. and my voice dropped, um, but I'd forced it to break essentially. And so, so you were in eighth grade. So your voice was already a little bit past and, and like kind of grown up or were you at the precipice where you were already was, starting I was still singing in, in, uh, I was, I was a soprano mm -hmm. and, um, uh, just that fear just fucked it all up. It killed me, man. And, um, so I, I, because I, I realized what it meant and being at an all boys school, when that word was, you know, when you were tarred with that word, yeah, it brought a lot of, a lot of trouble. And, yeah. um, you know, I watched kids get beaten up you know, yeah. by others, um, for being tarred with that same brush. And so I just thought this is my life's at risk, you know, my, my, I'm, I'm at risk here. And so I wanted to kind of try to step out of it. And the only way I, I thought I could was to step away from the choir and start talking in a deeper voice, try to be a bit more masculine and, and blend in, you know, sort of be a, a, middle school gray man and just blend in yeah. Um, so that I'd avoid, avoid catastrophe. But um, having come out of that, I just stopped singing. Yeah. And it wasn't until um, I'd be, of course I still listened to music and um, I started uh, sort of flirting with, with metal and all sorts of things a little bit earlier than that. But um, my dad gave me a guitar and then I, I ended up getting a bass guitar for my birthday and started really making a foray into that. Um, and it wasn't until I heard Faith No More's Angel Dust for the first time. I remember, I remember buying it. I remember where I was. Um, <laughs> I, it's like, a, it's, it's clear as day. I remember getting home and going, right. And putting it on and listening to it and just going, oh my God, you can do this. Yeah. And, and it changed my perception um, of all of that stuff. It wasn't like I wasn't into other singers. I was, but yeah. just hearing Patton do that, that stuff with his voice yeah, um, in the way that he did it, the affected vowels and all of that stuff, I was like, this is it. Yeah. Um, and it changed everything for, for me. And so I started retraining myself to sing, just singing along to that album. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, with a very limited range. And yeah, I mean, uh, how long did the the kind of damage? I mean, were you scoped, and did you have actual damage? Or you just were fucked up every day. Like, tell me about that. I was fucked up every day. So um, <laughs> I'd, I'd go to sing something, and I'd be like, "Hey!" So it was hey. just, just yeah. I really damaged myself. Um, how long did I it didn't? Last? It lasted. It was about. Well, prob probably about four years until I felt Jeez. I could, like I was getting my voice back. Yeah. Um, and it was by that time that I'd changed schools. I was now at a school. It was still a private school because I couldn't get out of it. Yeah. But there were girls there. It was a co-ed school. So yeah. all of a sudden there were girls on the scene and we're going to parties and I'm singing at these parties trying to impress girls, essentially. And... um which made me work even harder. That gave me, gave me, you know, yeah, the incentive to keep working and, <laughs> uh, and it worked like it, it worked. I got great results from that, but um, 
it was yeah it was probably about four years but i i still feel like i'm working through some of that trauma that physical trauma still yeah. to this day um it it's funny yeah. to hear that and to know that, you know, so much of that was just because of the boys' school and that there was no actual safety from females being in there because most of my high school and stuff experience was really shitty from a masculine perspective and getting bullied and fucking getting fights all the time. But there was always a safety net because I was a cute mm -hmm. kid and all the girls loved me. So there was always yeah. that kind of safety and, and it would have been in your case too where you know if you were able to show a sensitive side of that and you were good at singing and everything there would have been that like well i guess he's going out with stacy so he's not that <laughs> you know? but you literally just had none of that so what a fucking what a just really difficult night and day experience because if one one dude turned on you like all the dudes turned on you and then you're just that's insane so i i lost my singing voice for about five years um, I had some trouble in, in my uh, marriage and just with music and trying to move forward and trying to be who I needed to be. And um, I quit music and I started to lose my singing voice and then I started to lose my actual voice. And just like you, in a sense, like sometimes I still deal with uh, kind of this, the repercussions of that from, I guess, an emotional, physical perspective. But um, it's interesting to hear that sometimes you can kind of still feel that. Um, and then now you're known for having a deeper voice or kind of being able to, you know, I don't know, you just have this wonderful deep tone, but it's funny to yeah. hear that you kind of didn't have that. I mean, is, does your father have like a deeper voice or this is all just. Um, he's definitely a tenor, but he sort of, as time went on, he, he started leaning more into the baritone side. So he, he's actually, I reckon, you know, at his prime, far more dexterous than I was. Mm. Um, but uh, or I am, but, um, he says he, 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 you know, speaks to the contrary. He's like, Oh no, you were better. But, um, uh, yeah, he kind of, he started leaning more into his baritone cause he, he's sort of made a foray into, um, jazz pop and, and it's kind of this lounge jazz pop stuff, which is fantastic. And a lot of it sort of called for a bit of a deeper thing. So I think he was a natural baritone, but he would sing in a tenor range right. um, quite a lot. Um, but then, yeah, sort of leant back into that that part of his voice. Right. Um, yeah. But so I was definitely soprano. I was like lead soprano. Yeah. Um, and had an incredibly high voice. And um, uh, not quite castrati, but but pretty close. And, uh, you know, sort of Farinelli. But... Um, uh, yeah, I was always given the solos, you know, especially because we, we used to have to do chapel services um, once or twice a week. And I was always the soloist and I'd have to do these high, you know, the, a lot of that, a lot of those sort of classic Church of England hymns right. had that really high soprano kind of leading the charge. And, and I was that guy. I, I just, uh, it just kind of came into my memory. I remember um, trying to join choir and probably like, third grade or something and i knew i could sing i didn't really do it in front of anybody but i some part of me wanted to do it and i remember uh, a kid in class saying you sound like a girl and that pretty much shut that shit right down for me too um i just kind of i think i did a couple plays and like a couple things and then i just sort of just was too afraid of it and i look back now and then i was like was i singing in straight up falsetto like i don't know what i exactly i was doing but i know that it's a similar experience and i know that we both teach so i try mm -hmm. to tap into people's minds with with the vulnerability and just the ego and so much shit that we carry with that stuff and when people come to somebody like you and i and they're they're just really just waiting for somebody to be like hey you're good yeah. um there's so much there's so much in that and i try to we don't we can get into that later but um yeah. and i don't want to keep you forever either but yeah i try to train people from a physical perspective so that they're not just listening to everything that comes out of their head and then trying to change it you know it's kind of yes. like it's kind of like weightlifting i've said this plenty of times kind of like weightlifting and they're looking at themselves in the mirror trying to correct their form but they're not attached to the body at all they have no idea what they're doing they're just trying to be like does this look good do i look good right yeah, now yeah. It's like, man, yeah. you gotta, you gotta tap into the body and figure out what you're fucking doing. But anyway, I had to, I had to ask you this really quick. Now you were in the, the Catholic, the, the, the whole Christian thing. I know they're different, but <laughs> whatever. It's all, it's all, it's, it's all oppressive as fuck. So you were in that, 
And then how did the kiss thing work out? Because typically that just is every red flag and you're going straight to hell. Your family was yeah, yeah. okay with that. They didn't they didn't just go like Oh Nick, that would totally you're cool. gonna go to the devil. You're gonna <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, my, 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 probably the most Christian of, um, my close family was probably my grandma okay. um, on my mom's side, my mom's mom, but she wasn't a practicing Christian. She just believed in, you know, certain values of, you know, moral values and understanding and acceptance and, and that kind of thing. So there wasn't any aversion to me expressing myself. In fact, she loved it. That's awesome. Um, she, she took you know, great pleasure in watching me do those things. So it was never, I was never um, dissuaded by any of my close family. Um, But yeah, I mean, my, my parents uh, sort of had a discussion before I was born, just saying, what do we do? Like, do we introduce him to religion? Like what, what do we do? And they came to the same place where they're like, why don't we just let him decide for himself? That's Um, awesome. I was really fortunate for that because I could. And, um, you know, I had many, uh, really sort of deep critical thinking based chats with both my mom and my dad throughout my life about those things. Yeah. Um, and at, at one, at one stage, um, I think I was in grade six, so I would have been like 12 and I noticed in chapel or church that we do every week, um, for school, uh, as choristers that they do communion right and they were partaking in in alcohol free wine um but these these little communion breads and i i'd watch this week after week after week right and it's one week i'm like i want to try that <laughs> right i went to the reverend and i said um i was wondering if i could volunteer my services to help with the service because they, they basically had, you know, there were a few boys that would have to help with the service. So one would sort of walk out with the incense at the start of the ceremony. Um, others would carry the, you know, they had like this scepter, you know, and, and all of this pomp and bullshit really. That, um, <laughs> and, and I didn't believe in any of it. Right. But he's like, Oh, you're, so you're a Christian. And I looked him like dead in the eye. Went, oh yes. Yes, ab- absolutely. And yeah. like, okay, well, we'll trial you out next week. And um, the boys were the first, the guys that would help the reverend were the first to receive their communion. Um, and I'd lied to this guy <laughs> just so I could try the, the bread, the, these little wafers. Yeah. And um, I thought the wine was disgusting. And then I had the wafer and it just kind of dissolved in my mouth and it was tasteless. And I kind of went, I'm not sure if I'm into the blood and body of Christ. <laughs> and I... My uh, <laughs> choir master then, she, she said, look, you can't do both. You yeah. can't lead the choir and do that. So what would you prefer? And I'm oh, definitely choir. <laughs> you know, that's, so then the very next week I'm back sort of leading the choir. Um, Great. But yeah, uh, there, was, there was a lot of that shit going on, um, a lot of indoctrination. And um, it was kind of there that I picked up a lot of the antithesis. So... Um, we had to do services for uh, the boys who were then in middle school and senior school. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of dudes, I remember real rebellious guys. And there was one in particular who I was just like, I don't know what that guy's deal is, but I love him. You know, he was just cool. He had long hair and he used to wear Megadeth t-shirts under his shirt. So sometimes (laughs) you'd see him at lunchtime and he would have unbuttoned his shirt. He's got this, you know, peace cells t-shirt underneath it. I'm like, that dude's cool. <laughs> and um, in chapel, you'd have to, you know, they had pu- these pews. So they'd have, you know, this part of the service where, you know, you'd have to get down on your knees at the pew and pray and blah, blah. And he'd get down on his knees, but he'd make this like, <laughs> and he'd sit yeah. there like this. Yeah. And I'm like, what's he doing? Yeah. And, um, I saw it this one time and uh, we'd been doing um, sort of cross choral services with the senior choir. Right. And I'd made friends with one of the guys there cause he was into metal and he started making mixtapes for me and you know, he'd give me like kill them all. And he was introducing me to a whole heap of metal um, anthrax and all sorts of stuff. 
And uh, I asked him, what's that dude doing? Like, what's this thing? And he's like, oh, dude. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the devil. It's like, hey. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, that's awesome. That's cool. So it kind of, weirdly enough, um, that started my path to challenging what I was being indoctrinated by. And I started sort of leaning towards the people that were kind of going, no, I don't want any of this bullshit. Yeah. Um, and, and to ask them and talk to them about why. Yeah. And it was, it was with a lot of these guys that I learned what Christianity actually represented and what it was. Um, Cause a lot of those older kids were studying history. They were getting into high school history. They were learning about the crusades and all of that stuff. Yeah. So they were telling me about, you know, um, theocratic oppression and all sorts of stuff. So I, that switched me in a really big way. Um, yeah. So I was from, from those moments, I was singing hymns somewhat reluctantly, but I was still singing because I loved my, my choir master and I wanted to do a good job just for her. Yeah. Um, so I just sing whatever was put in front of me. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, but that's, that started my path. Right. To the questioning religion and trying to work my way out of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, there's a lot I could say about that too, but uh, I had some similar experiences with that. It's also interesting hearing about um, your knowledge of history and, and kind of learning about those things and how much we just don't have that here and didn't have that here. It's similar in England where, you know, I would hear John Cleese from um, Monty Python and stuff talk about them learning about history and how much they just know and how much they can go through it and just call it up at will. And then I'm like, fuck, I don't know any of this shit. We just didn't yeah. learn those things. And it could be because I grew up in a <laughs> dumber, a dumber location, but uh, not many Americans going around um, regurgitating information like that and being able to, cause we just didn't really learn it. Um, yeah. It's a shame. But uh, once again, everybody's got their backwoods um, connections and, and, and uh, my family just, very simple people, man. Um, I am I am a weird alien person amongst my family, and uh, I don't know how I came into them, and we'll get into that at a different time. Anyway, sure. amongst <laughs> all this, when did you meet these uh, these twelve foot ninja folks? Did you get to grow up with some of these guys? Did you come into that later? Um, that's an eclectic bunch of dudes. It is. Um, no, I I actually found them on MySpace. And, um, well, it wasn't MySpace. It was a, it was a website called Mel band and I'd been in this other band, um, for about five years and it just, it wasn't going anywhere and it kind of dissolved and, um, you were just singing. Yeah. Well, I was playing guitar and singing in that band and, um, uh, I kind of came out of it and I was looking for other, other bands to get involved with, but I'd thought to myself, I, I don't know if I want to play guitar and sing. Yeah. I think I'd rather just sing. Same. And, um, anyway, I saw a, an ad, um, this really fucking quirky ad, <laughs> um, for <laughs> a vocalist who was influenced by a lot of the, a lot of the vocalists that I loved, like they wanted, um, Patton was the top of the list, but Jamiroquai was in there. Hmm. Um, and a few others. So I'm like, that's my lane. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, the link led me to the, the MySpace page and um, yeah, Stevic had created this weird video, um, you know, sort of looking for a vocalist and I just thought it was insane. I loved it. And, and it was all about ninjas and I was massively into ninjas <laughs> um, throughout my teens, my childhood. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I, I thought, fuck it. I'll, try out and um uh so i ended up i ended up sending them a demo um from my previous band that i thought was more applicable to sort of a pattern-esque styling because the old band was pretty proggy um and i was drawing on different influences for that but uh there was one song that we did that was very much the sort of pattern side of me so i i sent them that um i got a message the next day just going hey dude we'd love to chat mm -hmm. and um so that's kind of how it started. And, um, they asked me to, uh, go to our, you know, Russ's house for a little jam session and a, and a chat. Um, so I went and did that, then discovered the Russ, the drummer, uh, was really good mates with one of my cousins. Um, 
And so there was a connection there, but I didn't know these guys at all. I knew of Russ um, because he'd been in uh, a couple of bands, or one in particular that um, had kind of done the rounds around Melbourne and were quite sort of, in an underground sense, quite infamous and really eclectic music. So I knew of Russ, um, but yeah, it just kind of started there. So I, I did this audition sort of jam with them and um, yeah. And then they came back and just said, look, we reckon you're the guy. Are you interested? So I just jumped in head first and um, Sweet. the rest as they say history. Now you were doing yeah. proggy stuff and you were writing vocals or were you doing a lot of covers or were you, I mean, you're, ability to write melodies and catchy hooks over some of the craziest shit ever is really uh, amazing. Um, work, like how long were you developing that? And, uh, you know, when did you, I don't, like I said, I don't want to backtrack, but um, when did you kind of start writing these, these melodies and writing your lyrics and shit like that? When did that start? Um, I think it really started when I was about uh, 16, 17. Okay. And um, basically through, uh, a friend that I'd made who owned a cafe um, just down the road from us called the Vegas lounge. And it was this really like bohemian cafe. It was awesome. And um, yeah, this, this guy, Eddie Vegas. Um, That's the coolest name he, I've ever heard. He's a, he was the biggest dude. Like, and just from the first time I went in there, he was like, I want to know all about you. Oh yeah. And um so we formed a real bond. And so I'd go down there often and, uh, you know, he'd close up shop on a Friday and I'd hang out there on a Friday night and we'd just smoke spliffs and play <laughs> guitar and watch, watch music videos in the back yeah. room. And, um, uh, yeah, so he, there was a, an acoustic guitar um, in that room and pretty much any time I'd hang out in the back lounge. I'd grab the guitar and just sit it there and just sort of play through some things. Yeah. And um, yeah, this one night I went down there and we we're hanging out and he said, oh, by the way, you see that guitar? I'm like, yeah. He goes, it's yours. Oh. Like, what? And he goes, yeah, that's yours. And he goes, now I want you to go and write. Oh man, that's, a, that's amazing. Fuck. You know, and that's I had an electric think Eddie Vegas home. does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's his, that's his MO. Um, <laughs> I had an electric guitar that my dad had given me at home, but I, I was just kind of writing these one string riffs and stuff on that. But that was where that kind of gave me the inspiration to actually start yeah. writing songs. And um, so I just started with that guitar and um, I just sit in my room stoned out of the court <laughs> and I had a little, little cassette deck and um, just a little portable cassette deck. And it had a little microphone hole in the top of it. Um, so I could record myself playing, you know, yeah. and then I'd, I'd figure out a track and then I'd record it all. And then I'd play it back and then try to figure out the melodies and the lyrics and everything. And then I'd marry them together. Right. And um, uh, yeah, so it was kind of around about that, that stage. So that kind of, I, that then led me to... Um, you know, trying different, playing with different people. So I've, I've played with a lot of different musicians throughout my life um, to explore songs. And I picked up a lot from, from each one um, and kind of, I guess I'm an amalgam of a whole heap of, of resources. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't end up sort of finishing school and then going to college or university to pursue music. I just, I got to the end of, um, well, it was nearly the end of my last year at school and I left early because I'm like, I don't need to graduate. I know what I'm going to be. Yeah. Music's my thing. Um, so I just left early and, and just kept writing. And um, that translated to, to, I bought myself a keyboard, this um, uh, Roland XP50, which was like a workstation keyboard started writing drum patterns and, and actually kind of composing things. And that helped me develop a lot in that, in that sense as well. So, right. um, yeah, that's kind of really where it came from. It wasn't, it wasn't taught to me. Um, yeah. I was just sort of borrowing and 
stealing from as many sources as I could. Essentially. I guess in some ways it all kind of comes down to that, you know, it's being filtered in through somewhere and the filter's stronger or weaker, but I think I tend to feel like a lot of times it's just being beamed into my head, especially those wonderful times when you wake up at like 2 a.m. and it just, the shit just keeps playing and you're like, okay, boop. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm gonna remember that, and then thousands of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, you just you try to name them, and then you go back through, and you're like, man, I, I don't know what the fuck that is, but that is, yeah, I don't know what the melody is. I don't, yeah, I ba- yeah, you can barely tell what the melody is, but it probably sounded good at the time. Anyway, um, now from the beginning, was Twelve Foot Ninja just completely? just that thing or did it evolve into like was there a discussion we're gonna fucking mix all this stuff together because uh there's got to be in some ways as a writer there's an intimidating factor of like okay i'm gonna be writing over top of this and then it's gonna change this and it's gonna evolve to this like tell me a little bit about that because it's it's unlike anything i've ever heard Uh, if i can take that a step further i remember uh, being introduced to it and then wanting to not like it right out of the gate because it was was so and there was a comedy element too which usually does not pair well with (laughs) some of this stuff i mean system of a down kind of did it there's there's not many bands that can do it well it's either kind of goofy and it's just that or it's serious and it's just that but but having the marrying of the both is not something many people do well anyway i've said a whole bunch of things but the point is is that even as more of a purist or whatever the fuck i am bitchy musician um i didn't know if i wanted to like it but then all the elements connected and the talent was there and i was just like yeah man this is pretty fantastic and like i said then the comedic element of the videos and stuff you're like this is this is terrific (laughs) yeah yeah well you're you're not the first to say that i've i've heard that time and time again from people um said that very same thing i i didn't want to like it at the start Mm -hmm. Um, because it is jarring. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's the marriage of, of seemingly disparate styles. Um, and, you know, in order to love one, you kind of have to accept the rest as well. Um, but we used to, we, we used to have people that would say to us, like, I love the reggae, but I don't like the metal. And then others are like, I love the metal, but I don't like the reggae. Um, yeah. and then you'd have everyone in between who was quite open-minded and had a, a far more eclectic palette but yeah you know i think that was one of the commonalities between um you know at least stevic myself and and russ was that we listened to a whole range of different things so that was kind of sold to me from the start that um stevic was getting into dub trio at the time um loves jamiroquai um loves sort of new metal you know especially corn and and um got into Pantera and all sorts of stuff. So he wanted to just fuse all of, all of those things together, just try to marry them. And um, so, yeah, I think that was probably one of the biggest draws for me was that it was so diverse. It was so eclectic. Yeah. Um, there was lots of scope and, and um, lots of room for different types of colors that you wouldn't normally put on just a straight hard rock track or metal track. Um, so the, I think for me that I was kind of, I thought the premise of being able to express myself in a myriad of different ways, as opposed to just that singular kind of way. Yeah. That was really alluring. Um, But yeah, it was pretty much there straight out the gate. And then some of those influences would, would kind of change. Um, So, you know, you can hear it between the first two EPs. New Dawn was definitely the amalgam of all of those things. Mm -hmm in I, what I felt was a very balanced kind of way. Yeah. Uh, then the new metal side of it started taking a little bit more prevalence um, for the, the second EP, Smoke Bomb, probably due to uh, Damon, you know, getting involved in the band and all of the new metal kind of influence that he was bringing to the table. So it kind of lent a little bit more in that direction Mm -hmm. started getting a bit more um technical riff wise you know that kind of thing um but yeah sometimes you know the other genres would dominate and then sometimes the the heavy stuff would dominate it was kind of this fine balance between those those forces i Um, think if you if you gave most musicians a homework assignment of writing something like that almost 
almost 95% of them, whatever they would come up with would feel forced. It would almost yeah. certainly feel like they just fucking crowbarred that shit together, even if they did it even kind of in a nice flowy way. But for some reason, you guys, it never seemed forced. And maybe that was because you were over top of it, just connecting these pieces uh, and singing over top. But anyway, like I said, had to ask because it's, it's definitely unlike anything I've ever heard. Now, um, I read your exit, whatever you want to call it, your basically your exit statement. I don't know how many years that's been now since you uh, decided to step away from that. Is that two oh, years, three was, years? Yeah, it was um, the end of 2020 was when I made the decision. Right. Um, but I don't think it was announced until uh, late 2021, I think. Right. Um, was it then? Yeah. It might have been the following year, um, only because we we... Yeah, I think it was. I think it was the end of 2021, like October or November. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I'd sort of, I'd exited, but I've like, it uh, didn't really end until, um, when was the last show? Uh, early, I think it was about almost mid 2022. Um, wow. Okay. And, uh, we did some shows at the start of the year. We were still we were kind of coming out of the pandemic, but there were still restrictions and all sorts of things happening. Oh, yeah. I did a few gigs. Um, they had auditioned some new singers. Um, and yeah, they'd, they'd found one, but it kind of didn't work out. Um, we were going to do a tour uh, at the end of 2022. Um that was going to be kind of my farewell show and they were going to introduce this new singer that all all got kiboshed pretty pretty severely um because i chose not to continue um the offer was handed to me to to continue and i i i refused i stood with my decision um it didn't work out with this other singer in the meantime and they were going to essentially just continue with that singer um into a tour uh, which I think was supposed to be the start of last year, right? Uh, February. And uh, I could have my years wrong, but anyway. Um, and because uh, it feels like it's been such a long time. Uh, but yeah, anyway, it, it sort of didn't work out. I was offered to, to um, also extend into that tour. And yeah, after I'd kind of refused to continue with the band, then it was, everything was cancelled. Well um, yeah. Like I mentioned, uh, not to get too far into it, and, and I don't want to bash anybody, but I will. Ha I will say this, and fucking, I can edit it out if you're like, yeah, don't, don't fucking say it. Anyway, so I auditioned um, online for the band, which was you know yeah, yeah. weird thing, just kind of like on a whim to see if maybe it would go anywhere. But if even if it were to happen, I'd just be mimicking you the whole time. <laughs> so it's like that's always that weird world of trying to be like, would this make me happy? I think I would just be trying to live in his shoes the whole time. Anyway, got to the second part of that audition process and Stevic had sent an email. And when I say an email, I mean a fucking book exactly. about basically what music means and what writing in this band means and everything. And it was so uh, like, oh shit, this is fucked. Like it was, um, it was so just kind of intimidating. Like, uh, I had worked with Forrester Savelle and I reached out to Forrester to be like, can you tell me a little bit about Stevic? Like, would this be a nightmare if I were to join this? And he didn't really say a good thing either way. He um, hasn't ever seemed like the most like emotional dude. But um, either, even with that, like I even wanted to get a little bit of feedback to be like, it feels like this would just be uh, you're riding Stevic's train and you're on that train and you don't deviate from that train. I don't know. So I picked up on a little bit of that from kind of your exit statement and stuff. And I figured I'd bring it up. But like I said, it's not, not in any kind of negative way where I want you to say terrible shit or no, no, what I'm saying. But no, I mean, I, mean I, I, there's a lot I can't say um, yeah. contractually, but yeah, yeah, it was Stevic's train. I yeah. can at least say that it was definitely Stevic's train. And, yeah. um, uh, that became more and more apparent over time. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I think that was one of a multitude of reasons why I I, I couldn't continue. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel like there was really the freedom or leeway to to really be myself. I'd condensed myself down to a to a 
a much more palatable form for him, yeah. essentially. And management to a certain degree as well. Um, Which is so, very ironic considering the music because the music's so many different things. And then f- <laughs> thinking about you having to condense yourself and make it more palatable is, is hilarious, quite frankly, considering the nature <laughs> of 12 Foot Ninja. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it was just, it was, it was a tough ride. It never, it was very rare that it felt like fun. It was always like, always felt like there was something at stake or something on the line. It was always very, corporate and business like and um and and then you you know lump in with that you know decisions that were made like shot from the hip you know (laughs) yeah ready shoot aim we used to call it um yeah it's such a strange thing to be involved with um on so many levels it was so conflicting because i I love touring. It was my favorite thing. It is my favorite thing to get out there, explore the world, but also meet and communicate um, with people from different cultures, different backgrounds, different perceptions of reality, to get on that stage and just let it all hang out. And um, that really, that was my greatest reward for sure. Um, So that was keeping me in the band. just that life experience and yeah i got to i got to get out there and um it's what i'd wanted i think that was you know the point was is that that's really what my dream was um it was the performance aspect of it uh, more than anything else um so there was that but then all of that other minutiae it was <laughs> it, i i i had great difficulty with that conflict and it and then you know the internal conflict that that comes from that should i stay or should i go yeah um and there were there were quite a few times um throughout the past where i i was very very close to leaving and um luckily at the time you know there was one time where russ talked me out of it and said nah man like stick at it it's going to be worth it conquer the freaking world it'll be it'll be great then there was another time where ro took me you know talked me off a ledge and went no no you're going to regret it if you leave now yeah um but yeah when it was time to leave it was time to leave um when that door was kind of finally opened for me um i stepped through it right now tell me about you know leaving that i'm sure there's a lot of fear and everything um was it a big weight lifted off like you know do you feel better now do you sometimes still question it or do you you know it seems like you're having a pretty healthy place mentally with it now and and knowing that that was what was supposed to happen but yeah um it felt right to make the decision and it felt like the right time everything had kind of lined up you know as sometimes it does you know you you feel like you're stepping into that slipstream of synchronicity and it was like everything lined up yeah so that when that occurred it was like oh yeah of course that's the next natural step yeah um so i didn't feel any regret for stepping out but what then comes as a result of leaving something like that is you start sort of going into this retroactivity where you start sort of thinking about the past thinking about your experiences how things kind of played out um and it was almost for me i kind of went i I went into quite a deep depression sort of through that period and that that had started a couple of years before i exited um i realized too i i we were doing gigs in 2021 that's when it happened we were supposed to do an october tour at the end of 2021 so i'm just making that amendment um but i'd kind of started uh, stepped into a very deep depression and I, I've always been depressed, like since I was a kid, but it's always been kind of manageable. Whereas when it, when it occurred for me this time and um, it, it started just before my, my daughter was born actually. And I started questioning, am I going to be a good dad? Like, what can I provide for her? I'm in this band that's not bringing in any money, but I'm dedicating most of my life to it. It's a career that I'm dedicated to, but there's nothing um, what sort of a life is she going to have? All of that, and I and it just triggered me into this into this very deep place. And um, so leaving the band was in the midst of a lot of that. And 
then there kind of came this depression, this wave of depression after because I started going into that, you know, am I going to regret this? Yeah. Um, have I left something that, that is the golden ticket? You know, yeah. can I can, have I lost relevance? Am I too old now to start again? Happen, um, happens to me often yep and how we identify yeah. ourselves you probably identified yourself you know through that lens for so long then yeah. wondering how do you identify well, yeah it's funny i didn't i i did but i didn't so i used to say to people romantically oh it's just something i do it's not who i am right yeah. and i think i used to say that to convince myself and then it wasn't until i left that i'm like who the fuck am i <laughs> Right, right. And, yeah, I, I, and, and it, I, I figured it out and I went, oh my God, you really did. Yeah. See yourself as, as that thing, as that role. Um, yeah. that, it, that was who you were. Um, and so it's, it's taken me a really long time to uh, somewhat claw back those pieces of myself that I, I felt I had to trunicate to be in the band. Yeah. Um, but also a sense of myself beyond it. And um, I think too, you know, I came out of it uh, not knowing where to go. There were no offers. It wasn't like there were bands throwing themselves at me going, please be our singer. Um, I think there was one and they were, they were such a, a young band that didn't have their stuff sorted out. And I'm like, I, I can't, I don't know if I can deal with this on a mental health level. Like this is too much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden I'm hit by that wall of how are you going to continue? What, what does this mean? And um, people saying to me in comments and stuff, Oh, you know, when are we seeing a kin solo album? That was the last thing I wanted to do. Um, I, I didn't want to continue with kin even. I wanted that to die with right. my departure from 12 foot ninja and, and, step into something else and so i was I, I kind of i'm still tethered to a few things in in regards to um 12 foot ninja because things haven't kind of been sorted or settled completely so there's still things going on we've got an acoustic album sitting on a shelf that hasn't been released yet just saw um, that you know so it's uh, like until those things are kind of sorted i don't feel i i can fully move forward um but I've been doing commissions with other musicians um, since. And I think that's assisted me in kind of reestablishing connection to who I actually am um, essentially. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a process. And um, you know, I feel like, well, the thing that I came into the awareness of was that it'll, it'll probably always feel like this. Um, it'll always feel like I'm in flux. Right. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. I don't, I don't, want to get too comfortable um right even though when i was in the band i was screaming for comfort it was the one thing i wanted i wanted it to be stable it never felt stable mm. um and i was i was crying out for that and probably a little bit too loud for some of the other members you know and they go shut up shut the fuck up <laughs> um, but then i come out of it and now I think instability is actually worth leaning into and, and, you know, actually stepping into the unknown and allowing things to occur and, and doing my best to adapt to that and play with that and experiment with that and develop through that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anytime you get comfortable, yeah. you're just kind of in a state of decay, I guess. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard. Uh, we all want to be comfortable. We all just want a little bit of that routine and shit but then it tends to get boring and uh what what the fuck is there to write about you know you need things to happen you need life to happen and uh yeah well the last thing i'll because i've kept you for a while here and i again i really appreciate you talking to me about this and being so open about it it's it's great but, uh, so one of the good things about you moving forward is is definitely you have a great voice you're a great writer like i said um you have a definitive voice as well like something when i hear it i would know it was you i've struggled with that um for a lot of years and I'll try to sound like anybody and I don't try to you know step into anybody else's shoes but it's still I still find myself sometimes struggling to really figure out where I want to be where vocally what's home 
do you know of a moment where you or you know a process where you started to find out like this is uh, this is me and you could hear it you could feel it and you could kind of keep going back to that home base that nick home base vocally yes um i think it was actually quite early like i think i think it developed throughout you know the the prior band to 12 foot ninja and 12 foot ninja because you're kind of always in that state of self-discovery in that way as a vocalist yeah um hear other things and you're like oh wow that's a really cool approach i might try that um it's still that you know you kind of you 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 have to be i guess resourceful um as an artist so that also extends to your instrument um be that tonally for a guitar or tonally for a voice it's the same thing the development of new techniques or new approaches is pretty consistent mainly yeah. um so it had occurred quite early and, um, you know, I started realizing why I was aligning with like Patton in particular, because it reminded me a lot of my earlier influences. So um, I was very much aligned with voices like Peter Gabriel, um, Joe Jackson, Elvis Costello, um, some of those early sort of, or late punk early new wave voices where a lot of those vocalists especially the british ones were playing with their vowel sounds a lot and opening them up and um you know uh i think the song where it clicked for me was is she really going out with him by joe jackson mm -hmm. and you know just the, the way he sings out out with him like that i was like i love that yeah and it and, and i was young when i heard that and but i just loved that kind of dynamic expression, I was, I was endeared by it. So I realized that the reason why I was so into Patton was because he was kind of, he had amalgamated a lot of those kind of punk techniques. And um, so I I'd, I'd, I'd aligned myself a lot with Patton. I was kind of using him as a, as a guide stick for right. that kind of development. But um yeah, I kind of, I hit this place where I, I, you know, I went, oh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm an amalgam of a whole heap of vocalists. I was listening to a lot of Alice in Chains. I was Soundgarden. Um, you know, I was a teenager in the nineties. So a lot of that grunge era music I was massively into. And yeah. I was also into a lot of metal and a lot of thrash metal and, you know, um, and all of those vocalists but it kind of clicked. Oh, I've taken bits from a whole heap of people. Yeah. Then I go into a band where it's, you know, the, the number one kind of criteria for being a vocalist in said band was to sound like Mike Patton. So I'm like, Oh, okay. Now I'm leaning into that again. Okay. So it helped uh, you kind of gel a little bit more and, and yeah, stop, but, stop just being all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the feedback for my vocals a lot was, Oh, he's, he sounds like Patton a lot. And, was the number one i had some it was one comment that kind of threw me off because he's like man this guy sounds like the dude from man of war i'm like the hell <laughs> i don't think i've ever listened to man of war <laughs> um but uh i would that comparison was thrown at me a lot and i think some of it was was like endearingly thrown at me that way like oh wow he's like got the dexterity and the the baritone and all of that stuff and then it was um you know thrown at me in a in a very critical way as well um yeah. that i hadn't i wasn't doing my own thing but i think where it clicked and actually stevic helped me realize this um it was after it was post silent machine we'd kind of started making a foray into the states and man the the amount of there was a wave of comments and criticism coming from the states of oh yeah he's like you know uh writing mike Patton's wave and it kind of started cutting me up a bit and i'd we we started touring over there and most people were coming up to me after the show saying man great show love your stuff love your work man you're so much like Patton." and i'd kind of go, oh thanks yeah. yeah and then i'd go backstage and go fuck man i just can't shake this guy yeah and stevic had said to me dude you realize you like you don't sound like him <laughs> What do you mean? He goes, well, think of it this way. If we A, B'd your voices together, yeah, like sure, you use certain techniques that he uses, but you're totally different. You've got a totally different tonality. Sure, you're still in baritone, 
and there are there are things that you do that are par- you know pattern esque. He goes, but you're totally different. Yeah. Um, and he was he was the only one to really point it out. Yeah, and it was from that moment that I went, oh, I have established my own thing, right? Which then hop back to ah, I'm an amalgam of everything I've listened to. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I've, I've got a lot of influences, but I've definitely, um, yeah, it's, it's more on a sort of technique base level than, um, really wanting to sound like them. Like I'm yeah. doing my best Mike Patton impression every time I'm up there on stage. It's not the case. Of course. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I'm sure it'd be the same for you. It's like there are, there are certain colors from different vocalists that you kind of, you weave together. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that's really where it clicked for me that I I was establishing my thing. And then by the time we got to the second album, um, Outlier, I definitely felt like I stepped into that finally. And um, I started calling myself a singer at that stage. Yeah. I'd reluctantly done so. I'd always called myself a vocalist. Right. But it wasn't until around that time that I started considering myself just psych- psychologically a singer. Yeah. And it's really where... I started getting more and more focused on what I was doing and how to do it better. Right. That's amazing. So yeah, it, it was, yeah, it's, it's taken me a really long time to realize that. And I'm sure there'll be more realizations in the future of, you know, what that is, what my individual thing is. Um, yeah. Cause it's always, it always feels to me like it's changing and it's morphing and, you know, at one yeah. stage it's another, it's this. So. Yeah, a lot of times I get I get afraid of feeling like I'm in a box, so then I'll push things outside of the box, and then you're like, "Sure, wish there was a box here." <laughs> so uh, totally, it can well, get comfortable in the box. It's like I know what I'm dealing with here, and then yeah. as soon as you step out, it's like, "What the fuck you're what waiting the fuck for? Am I doing like yep. I, I don't even know how to do this anymore." When you're um, in that box, though, you're just waiting for somebody in the crowd to yell out, you know, <laughs> "You're in a yeah. box, man!" You're like, "Nah." Fuck yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right, fine. Play well, Freebird. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's every fucking show I do. Still, there's always some dick that's still saying that. Glad that we've all had that experience. And even mm-hmm. if you did it, they would probably be like, "This fucking song's too long," and then they would they would head out. Um, yeah, yeah. They wouldn't actually be like, "Holy shit, it's Freebird." Anyway, yeah. um, you know, I've had uh, some friends that have toured with you and always said really wonderful things and stuff. So I'm really glad I got a chance to talk to you. Um, yeah, right. You know, and I've I've thought about taking lessons with you. I've I've taught for thirteen years now. I've never had a vocal lesson, so I yeah, thought yeah. Some, I thought at some point I might reach out and be like, I should get a vocal lesson. <laughs> sure, sure, like, man. We can just, we can swap notes. You know, I think it's more than more than kind of me being able to teach you anything that you don't know. I think it's just more like sharing notes with each other because a lot of this stuff, as you've noticed, is is very observational. And you you, I wasn't given a, a teaching curriculum either. Um, yeah. my experience has been my teacher. I've had a lot of singing teachers over time, but, um, it's not until you're out there doing it and working it and dealing with the psychological side of it and the emotional side of it and pressure of being in a band and being, you know, on point every night, losing your voice in the middle of a tour, like all of those things. Um, yeah, it's only there that you actually kind of develop a pathway for other people. Yeah. um to kind of pick from and um so yeah we could just swap notes i'm sure that would be yeah man awesome i'd be yeah. happy to do any of it it's been wonderful talking to you man i'll let you go yeah. i'll be posting this at some point i don't think we said anything nobody was gratuitously using the n-word or anything so we should be safe no, no. If there's anything you said where you're like hey man take that shit out then people will just experience us talking and then blah, and then see that it was cut out and then wonder what we were talking about anyway okay. <laughs> it's been a pleasure man i really appreciate it thank you man all right buddy and, uh, yeah yeah speak to you soon hopefully all right man i'll be hitting you up at some point just to share something with you or who knows man i don't know or or i'll like i said i'll hit you up about a vocal lesson because that would be that'd be awesome to bounce ideas off of you so awesome mate oh well, right. yeah take care all right buddy see you all right see you mate